Hello, everybody. Welcome to Tea Time History Chat Live. We're 3rd of April, and today, because it's only a day following the anniversary of his death, we're going to have a little chat about um, Arthur Tudor. Now, some of you may have joined me in September on the anniversary of his birthday, where I did a whole hour, hour about Arthur. Um, that's the one that had to get yeeted into the sun. If you were here, you know why. <laughs> and um, I've actually just been watching it back, back and I was quite pleased with it. So I think maybe I'll edit it and, and repost it. But uh, any of you who are with me, remember, there was a little incident towards the beginning anyway. So let's try Arthur again. I hope you are all well. Um, thank you for joining me. I'm streaming live on YouTube, Facebook and Instagram. Welcome also if you are part of the Catch Up crew and you are catching this later or if indeed if you are listening on the podcast. Um, hi, I can see some people. This is recorded live by the way, so if you're watching this back, I am going to be saying thank you and hello to people who are watching live. Marianne, Diane, Linda and Deborah, I can see you already joining. Hi, how are you all? Um, and over there on Instagram, Instagram, I can't watch the comments. I'm so sorry. So I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not ignoring you on purpose, but I know you're there. And hi, if you can make it over to YouTube to watch me, I'm youtube.com forward slash British history. That's me over there. And you can catch me live. Um, so today, uh, Arthur Tudor, because like I say, we are just a day away or past the anniversary of his untimely death in uh, in 1502. So he died on the 2nd of April 1502 at Ludlow Castle. So I'm going to do something slightly different to what I did when I was talking about him in September. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Nancy. So um, uh yeah, so I will I will do something slightly different in case you caught that one. And like I say, I'm going to edit that one, edit out the the, the blooper, the beep, <laughs> and um, and put that back out. So what I thought I'd do today, though, it'll be a slight overlap, but I've got some uh, different uh, sort of bits. I wanted to speak a little bit more about Ticken Hill, um, which was a significant palace in Arthur's life. It's actually a significant palace, full stop, uh, of which there is very little left. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. And then I thought we would have a closer look or a close look at his tomb and chantry at Worcester Cathedral. Um, I For this, uh, there's a number of sources I've used, but I do want to mention that I have been looking at this book by Gareth Streeter um, about Arthur, Prince of Wales. And the reason I want to mention it is because I will be interviewing Gareth Streeter in a few weeks. So if you're a member of my Patreon, I will be uh, requesting questions as usual for, uh, for, for Gareth. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe maybe this chat will give you some questions, probably leave you more questions than answers maybe. Uh, anyway, we can put those to, to Gareth. So obviously you can support me with Super Chats on YouTube, uh, stars on Facebook, badges on Instagram. But the way I love for you to support me because I can give you so much back is my Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash British history. A lot of you here today already I know are members. Oh, hi, Pamela. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Nancy again. Um, Alison, I missed you there. Um, you, I know you're already patrons, some of you, and uh, and if you're if you're not, it's five pounds a month. You get to ask your own questions of historians. You get to be in part of it. You get, to, excuse me, to come to historical book club. Our book at the moment that we're reading is Nicola Tallis's Uncrowned Queen, which the title of which, on if you if you're watching, you can see it behind me. You can't read the title because I've rub it's rubbed off. It's a beautiful cover with gold writing on it, and I am. Um, I rubbed it off. Anyway, it is the uncrowned queen, the the life, uh, the fateful life of uh, Margaret Beaufort. So that's the way I would love for you to support me. At the moment, literally as I speak, until the end of today, you can put forward your questions for Estelle Perrong. I am, I am, excuse me, interviewing her uh, next week about her new book. Uh, I'll go get this right around. Is it Thorns, Glory, and Lust? or Lust, Glory and Thorns, it's about Anne Boleyn and her 
well, I've now read the book all by one chapter. I'm very uh, fortunate. I got sent a proof copy um, in preparation for interviewing Estelle. It's not out until May. I've read all by one chapter. I'm one chapter away from the end. Um, and when I built it before, I said that this was a book about uh, Anne Boleyn's time in France. It's actually about her relationship with France. So it does cover her time in France and then her ongoing relationship with France and how France intervened heavily, actually, in Henry's great matter. So in this, in his divorce proceedings from Catherine of Aragon, in uh, trying to get the Pope to recognise Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn. Um, and so it's, this, tr it, the, the, the book actually goes right through to, uh, to Anne's death. So uh, that's going to be a fascinating interview with Estelle. So if you've got a question you would like to put to Estelle uh, and you're in my Patreon, you can go along and do that now. If you're not, you can join today and put your question in. So, right. Oh, I also need to do a shout out, please, to Kellyanne, Lourdes and Laura, who have all become patrons in the last week. Right. So let's get on to Arthur. Pamela says he's such... He, Sorry, excuse me. Arthur is such in the shadow of Henry VIII. I can't help but wonder what the time was like when the roles were completely reversed and it was all about Arthur. That is a wonderful point, Pamela, because, of course, Arthur was the oldest son. He was, excuse the um, typo, sorry if that irritates people. Um, he was the eldest son, of course, of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. Uh, brought up to be you know, with with his education to be the next king, he was he was Henry the Seventh's heir. Henry, his younger brother, who of course would become Henry the Eighth, is brought up with his mother, with his grandmother, more thinking he was going to be going into the church. Ha! Huh, imagine. Um, and yeah, so Pamela's completely correct. Henry would have had a back seat compared to Arthur. Now, Arthur though doesn't grow up at court. Um, at the age of about seven, he is sent to um, to take up his role, titular though it would have been at the time, I suppose, of head of the uh, the, the Welsh marches. So he lives on the border uh, between England and Wales. Now, last time when I spoke about Arthur, we talked a lot about, as far as I remember, we talked a lot about Ludlow Castle. Um, and if you're coming on the Rise of the Tudors tour in September, um, then um, we are visiting Ludlow Castle. We, we're actually going to be going into Arthur's story quite heavily because, of course, the, he was part of that Rise of the Tudor dynasty. Less talked about now, of course, because he dies before his father. Um, um, but, yeah, I think, Pamela, it's such a good point that, he, we, when we're looking at the story of the Tudors, it's Henry the Seventh. Yeah, but if you've watched my interview with Nathan Armin, you would know what I mean about how it. it well, interesting doesn't cover it really. It doesn't. I, I'd like to think of a better word. The the life and times of uh, Henry the Seventh were at, when he was um, child teenager is exiled in France anyway if you haven't checked out that interview with Nathan please do it is currently uh it's, it's actually doing better than any other interview by this point that I've ever put out it's really popular um and for very good reason so um so yes yeah, so you've got Henry VII who's almost overshadowed by Henry VIII Henry VIII um who I have argued in the past and would still argue I don't think would be that famous if he hadn't had six wives. I think he just has become notorious and a good subject matter for drama uh, because he had six wives. That's my that's my opinion. Happy to debate it. Uh, although we're not going to talk about Henry today. And then, of course, Henry's three children, Edward VI, dies young, does quite a lot of, uh, makes quite a lot of changes before he manages that. Uh, Mary, the first, of course, but then you have Elizabeth the first who overshadows them all again. So you've got 
the two big figures out of the five, Henry VIII and Elizabeth, um, at the five monarchs, but then of course you've got Arthur. So um, here he is depicted in a stained glass window at a church in Great Malvern um, with the crown on his head, of course, uh, showing he is a, a prince. It says Principis underneath. Um, and um, so Arthur is being brought up as king in waiting and he is sent to, I can't remember what I've put on as the next slide. Yes. Okay. So last time we talked a lot about Ludlow, but I wanted to focus a little bit more today on Ticken Hill and because it's a, it's a less well-known palace, I think for two reasons, well, one big reason is it doesn't exist anymore in any real way. Um, as doesn't, you know, neither does Richmond or Nonsuch or where's the other one I'm thinking of? Be um, anyway, doesn't matter. Beauty. There's, there's others. Anyway, there's quite a few that don't exist anymore. But I think also for its location. So Ticken Hill Palace was in a, uh, a town called Beaudley which is a stone's throw away from where I live, actually. Beautiful place. Looks Georgian now, but it, it's got it's got very old roots, medieval roots. The name Ticken Hill, actually, uh, is thought to be uh, Anglo-Saxon in origin with the, uh, it's sort of a, um, uh, it's, it's been manipulated over the time, but, the, but it kind of means goat hill, perhaps, maybe. Um uh, Kiana says it looks like a manor house. It does in this picture. So it would have been, uh, this is the great hall, uh, I, I, I think. And it's a, it's a hundred, it's described as having a hundred foot long great hall. It has a courtyard. It has all the buildings you'd expect. Um, it's sited on the top of a hill overlooking the river. Um, and it's, uh, it's a it's a it's well placed um as a stop off to Ludlow. Now I'd always thought of it as a stop off to Ludlow, actually, until I started looking into this a little bit more um for today. And there's a history uh which this is taken from, written in 1883, which uh it's it's a really it's a really fun read, actually. If you want, I can put the uh link to it in the show notes. And talks about Arthur using um, Ticken Hill on a much more regular basis. So not just as a stop off to and from uh, Ludlow when perhaps he's um, heading back to London or somewhere else in England, but that he would perhaps spend maybe almost half his time here with this being a place to come to um, I can't remember which way around he said whether this was the summer palace and Ludlow was the winter one. I imagine you'd want to do it the other way around, um, that you'd want to come here in the winter. Looks more much more cosy than the castle at Ludlow. Um, and therefore, the council of the marches would also be here. So it's not a retreat type palace. It is a working, it was a working palace in Arthur's time. It's also at Ticken Hill that the by proxy marriage was um uh took place between Arthur and the princess uh Katharina of of Aragon Catherine of Aragon um so um so Lucy says I thought you were going to talk about Tick Hill Castle that's only open one day a year now I don't know where that is so this is in Beaudley in Worcestershire um, it was, uh, Kin, it was built, it was actually, so it was actually owned by, it goes quite a long way back, but it was owned by the Duke of York, Richard Duke of York, who also owned, uh, was custodian of Ludlow Castle. That's the father of Edward IV. So when Edward IV became king, this becomes crown property by virtue of it now belonging to the king. Um, and therefore then it gets passed down. Richard III came here. Uh, Edward IV spent a lot of money on this as well, by the way. 
uh, I think Richard III did. I'm trying to remember from reading the, the, the history now. But um, then Henry VII, of course, becoming king, it's crown property. So he inherits it and uh, spends a lot of money on it and sends Arthur here and Ludlow. And like I say, I think he spends his time uh, between the two. I'm going to show you a map of where it is in, in a moment. But um, was there something else I was going to say about that? I can't remember. <laughs> there was something in my head that has now gone. <laughs> okay. Oh, the by proxy wedding. That was it. Um, let me give you a bit more detail on that. I did. I think I did count, um, do that uh, on, in the last one. But oh, where have I put it? So he he because there were about seven. Um, it was the nineteenth of May, fourteen ninety nine. Nineteenth of May. Ooh. Another significant Tudor date, but for a different reason. So Arthur is at Tickenhill. Catherine isn't. She's um, she would have been. Oh, how old was she at the time? Nine, I think. No, no, no. Anyway, she was she was decided to be too young to actually come. She comes. She comes two years later. She actually comes to England on the second of October, fifteen oh one. But the by proxy wedding happens nineteenth of May, um, fourteen ninety nine at Tickenhill. And it's a Span uh, Spanish ambassador de Puebla who stands in for Catherine, which I always think the, <laughs> these ceremonies must be very weird because they do have to do things like touch hands. There was the sort of consummation type ceremony where they lay on the bed and one leg exposed and all sorts of things like that. Uh, the couple um, had exchanged gifts. She she wrote a letter to Arthur, and it's all very. Um, very kind and nice and excited to be your wife and all this that they've never met. She's quite never met, never spoke, didn't didn't at this point speak the same language even, which is bizarre because they had been betrothed from the age from toddlers, like from the age of two or three. And yet she doesn't appear to have been taught um the English language in any great way. They could speak, they could converse, but um so yeah, so they didn't meet again. They didn't actually meet until October fifteen oh one, which is which is mad, isn't it? So, she, so they they met a few days after she after she lands in October fifteen oh one. Let me just have a sip of my tea. Excuse me. So, um, this is a tapestry, Flemish tapestry, depicting the court of Arthur and Catherine. Of course, Catherine, I'm going to be, well, hopefully, hopefully teaches somebody something, but you, you're probably fully aware. Catherine goes on, of course, to marry Arthur's younger brother, Henry VIII. Henry VIII decides on his own, big boy, to marry Catherine of Aragon um, when he becomes king. He's looking for a way to look mature, and what better way than to to get married? So um, he uh, so yes, yeah, so this this is supposed to depict depict their court. Um, I like to think it was quite happy, and of course it was though their marriage was cut short because Arthur dies. Uh, they they so they <clears throat> excuse me they meet they marry. Um, so they meet in the October fifteen oh one. They marry on the fourteenth of November fifteen oh one in a in a in a in-person ceremony at St Paul's. It's a massive uh, do. In fact, the only big public Tudor wedding other than, I don't know how public Mary I's wedding to um, uh, to Philip of Spain was at, Win at Winchester Cathedral, but certainly the wedding between Arthur and Catherine at St Paul's Cathedral in London had been a massive affair. Um, Henry VIII had walked Catherine down the aisle to give her away. Um, and uh, but anyway, that, at this point, all of that is in the, is in the future. Um, this is a thank you, Google Maps. This is a air view, bird's eye view of Beaudley. So you can see the River Severn going through the middle. Uh, the Bridge, um, which is there, I think was built in the late 18th century. I'd have to look at my dates. Um, I know that there was a um, 
a lot of houses, beautiful houses that had to be demolished to make way for it. The original bridge, I think, was um, built in the 14th century. Before that, there was a ferry service. Uh, so this has been a crossing place for a long time. Bewdley was also a inland port from Bristol. So the Severn goes all the way down uh, through Worcester, um, and it goes out to the the Severn Estuary, which is uh, which is where Bristol is, and um, and so ships would dock, and then and then 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 also bring goods up to places like Bewdley. This might have been the furthest upstream. I'm not sure. So um, you can see. Sorry if you're listening on the podcast, but there is on the edge of the town. Um, so the middle of the bottom of this this picture, you can start to see a, a more Greenland. So it's quite built up now, but you can see um, you can see the the like a, a few fields. It's like oh, they've left that bit. The edge of that is where Ticken Hill Palace was sat. Apparently, there is part of it still existing, but it has been incorporated into a later house, and that's a private house, as far as I understand. Where you can see it says Catesill House, um, it's actually uh, labelled on this Catesill House Hotel and Venue. I looked that up because there was a Daily Mail story when that came up for sale um, a few years ago, saying that that had been part of the original Ticken Hill Palace. Um, I'm not sure whether that's true or not. I don't know because um, I haven't found, I haven't done an extensive search, but I ha certainly haven't found any plans of what Ticken Hill Palace looked like. But if you can, uh, if you can see, it, it's actually quite a way from where uh, Ticken Hill should have been. So there is, um, I forget that I can't, I've got my, mouse on here but you're not gonna be able to see my mouse on here are you there's like there's greenery and there's like a looped road and Ticken Hill would have been just inside that I wonder if I can let's see if I can zoom in I don't know if I can no and I might then just mess the whole thing up now the next um picture I just put on out of interest because I want to show you just how historic Bewdley is on the screen now is, goodness knows, is it, it's how many blue markers on top of the map of Bewdley and near, nearby Ribbonhall. Ribbonhall actually was the original, that's the oldest part, but anyway. Um, they are all grade two, at least grade two listed buildings. Bewdley is a concentration of grade of listed buildings mainly grade two so if you um if you want to visit somewhere uh that maybe you've not thought of when you come to England I mean if you're around I'm I'm not far we can have a coffee and uh and I'll I'll show you around Beaudley we can go see if we can see Tickenell <laughs> we're not supposed to because it is private residence but um yeah so it's 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 a very very interesting place now I'm going to go back to the picture of Ticken Hill just while I talk about the next bit. Um, Linda, looks like an entire tour could be done that, could be done there. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm now thinking, oh, I wish I'd have stuck it, stuck it into uh, September's tour. But there's so many places we could have gone to. And of course, Ticken Hill isn't actually there. But when, after Arthur dies, he, uh, he, his body is embalmed at Ludlow Castle. Uh, there is uh, he lays in state. He um, there is a a, a, um, a ceremony. I don't know if it's a, there's one at the castle. There's certainly one at St Lawrence's actually, which I will show you a picture of um, because his heart. Uh, it says his heart is buried. It would have been probably everything in in terms of uh, his entrails and the, as part of the embalming process being removed. So his heart, let's say, is buried at St. Lawrence's Church in Ludlow. And there is, for, you know, there's a, there's a big ceremony here. After that point, um, I think he lays overnight here. There's a ceremony. And then the body is taken to Tickenhill. 
Uh, so back to Tickenhill, where it is, where it it stays uh, overnight again. The weather was atrocious. I we're talking April, so it's early spring for for England, and it had rained and it was still raining. It was lashing down. That means uh, in with the unmade roads uh, that it's very difficult to transport the coffin. And um, I think it's in uh, Gareth's book that he talks about how the, I think it was in Gareth's book, but there were supposed to be six, I think, horses to pull the, 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 um, the hearse. And they ended up having to use oxen. Um, yeah, so severe were the conditions that it took oxen to draw the chariot. Eventually, they reached Butley, where Arthur was taken to the chapel, almost certainly of the manor house, where he had spent much of his childhood. So, Tickenhill is, like I say, before this, I, before I looked into it um, this much, I thought Tickenhill was just a stopping off point. But it does appear that Arthur spent a lot of time here as a child, from the age of about seven, and then... Uh, certainly he, he and Catherine of Aragon um, stopped off here on their way to Ludlow after their marriage and his body comes back here to um, to, 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 to lie in, uh, not in state, um, uh, but to lie overnight ready for the next leg of the journey, which is Worcester. And I think Gareth also posits that perhaps the reason, there's a couple of reasons why Arthur is buried at Worcester Cathedral when actually Hereford Cathedral, home of the Mappa Mundi, um, is closer. Uh, one, you already have uh, a royal, not a great one, but you already have a royal there. So let me take you to Worcester. You have King John already buried there. Uh, and the other reason being that it's Potentially, this is this is what Gareth suggests is that because it's closest, uh, it's in the the parish. Um, yeah, it would have covered the area that Beaudley sat in. So, if this is a very important place, Tickenhill, Beaudley, which it seems to have been to Arthur, then then Worcester was a good selection for where his final resting place should be. Uh, I have, I was really hoping really hoping with uh, the research I did for today that I might come up with, I might come across the account that says how his body got from Bewley to Worcester. And I, this is going to be something that I'm going to talk to Gareth about, see if he's got any views. And the reason that it intrigues me so much, if we go back to the map of Bewley and the River Severn, so the River Severn um, You've got Tickenhill Palace, which really isn't far away from the river. It's on the hill overlooking the river. The River Severn goes right to the door. It has its own water entrance. Of, at Worcester Cathedral has its own water entrance on the River Severn. The weather is atrocious. Tudor England, if you listen to my interview with uh, James Clark talking about the dissolution of the monasteries, he, he, he mentions, I think, a couple of times how... Tudor England is modernized. It's becoming modernized, in you know, compared to the medieval period that comes before it, uh, except in its infrastructure. Its infrastructure is the same as it has been. Unmade roads, uh, which get muddy. The dissolution of the monasteries was, uh, it, it's sort of postponed every winter. It's sort of seasonal because the inspectors couldn't get around. Uh, in, in in the bad months. So you've got Arthur's body that, that, that wants to, they want to parade him uh, in a way that the public can see him. But I'm, I just, I, I know there was two riders who go on ahead. We know they rode to Worcester, but the account stops short of explaining exactly how Arthur's body gets to Worcester. And I just, I want to know, I want someone to, to, I want to find the account of it that definitely says he didn't go by river because that was, that's my, um, I'm not suggesting that is 
actually how it happened, but I'm wondering why it didn't happen if it didn't. Um, or that someone can can give me a good sound argument as to why in those kind of weather conditions they wouldn't have just sent the body by river. But anyway, I suppose I can argue with that with somebody <laughs> with Gareth, perhaps if he uh, if he has a different view. Oh. Excuse me, taking a sip of my tea. So I um uh will take you now to or back to Worcester. Now, Arthur, I keep I, sorry, I say uh now and uh a lot. Oh, Lucy, how flooded does the river get? So, hmm, the river gets very flooded. Uh, it always has done. There are marks in Beaudley, uh, near Worcester Cathedral, this water entrance that I'm talking about, which gives the high marks, um, I don't know, for maybe the last 100, 200 years, 100, 150 years maybe. I'm not sure when the earliest one is. Um, but I don't know how it would have been in Tudor times. And the reasons I, the reason I say that is Budley was an inland port. <clears throat> so ships did manage to get up the river to Budley, which would suggest that it is deeper than it is now because it's never dredged. It doesn't have traffic, uh, which would, uh, keep the riverbed clear or deeper. <clears throat> so it does flood. Um, presumably it always, it always would have done. I think it would have been perhaps a little bit more like, like the Thames now, you can't believe would ever have sort of be low enough for people to cross. But of course it was, I think the River Severn was at Beaudley. Um, and the ferry service was there as well for when that wasn't possible. So, um, so yes, it does flood, but I would, I would, um, I would suggest in a different way now and for the past 150 years than it would have done 500 years ago. But I could be wrong. But anyway, that's the way, that's hydraulics. Um, now, Gareth has got in his book here, the amount spent on Arthur's funeral is phenomenal. £892, two shillings and half pence vote size as well. Uh, on his funeral and the majority of that money no sorry well 40 percent of that money going on uh, black cloth so it was about you know this wasn't a secret funeral sometimes it can be thought of it like that because it's so far it is so far away from London um I think there are practical reasons and there probably are emotional reasons the king and queen would never have uh, have uh, attended anyway this is where Arthur um, basically had grown up, worked, is known. He can have a grand funeral seen by many of, of, of the subjects of England. He's buried near other royalty, um, but it's not a constant reminder in London that the heir to the throne has died. Um, I should say he's about 15. Nobody really knows how he died. The sweating sickness, which uh, is a disease which came and went. We don't really know what it was. Uh, was around in Ludlow. Catherine of Aragon gets sick as well. She, she obviously recovers, but Arthur uh, dies. And this seems to, this is another thing I want to discuss with, uh, another thing I want to discuss with Gareth when I interview him is Arthur's health prior to uh to his death to this final illness whatever it happens to have been what was it like because th the the fact that he uh gets this disease that we're not sure what it is but he gets it and it kills him uh gives rise to this assumption that he had that he was a sickly child that he's always, he'd always been in poor health um, but I'm not sure if that's true. So I'm going to go into that with, uh, with Gareth, Gareth Streeter when I interview him. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so Arthur ends up in Worcester. Now you can see the high altar there. If you'll look, if you're uh, watching this, uh, you can see King John's 
tomb, by the way, the chest tomb was put in much later to um, when they, there's a whole other story about how they <laughs> exhumed uh, King John thinking he wouldn't really be underneath the slab, uh, but he was. And, uh, and his thumb bone went missing. Oh, people take ridiculous souvenirs. The thumb bone is now in the uh, in in Worcester Cathedral's uh, library and archives, be, having been returned uh, by a uh, by a family member a few generations down. Probably didn't know what the hell to do with it. What on earth do you do with a king's thumb bone? You give it back to where it came from. Is what you do. Uh, Kieran says, it still seems odd to me that they never moved Arthur's body to Henry VII's additional chapel in Westminster Abbey. I, I'm, I would have to, I would probably ask a specific question about that, actually, to somebody, for instance, like uh, Gareth Russell, who knows about the sort of rules and whatever protocols around this kind of thing, of moving a body. When, um, when, Mary Queen of Scots was moved from Peterborough to Westminster on the orders of her son, uh, James I of England. That was very frowned upon by, by many, um, you know, to exhume her body and move her, including the grave digger who had, he, he lived to about 90. I think he'd had he buried her and he had to exhume her, or maybe he'd left to live way too long for that to have happened. But anyway, it was, it was, you know, I think there might be protocols and things around that. Um, and anyway, here was, was chosen specifically for him. And you can see that he has this magnificent chantry built around him. Now he's got a chest tomb. Let me see where I've, have I put it. Oh, no. I've, there we go. Um, but he's not in the chest tomb. I think he's he's in a vault somewhere, not quite beneath, somewhere to the side. But he's near the high altar. Worcester Cathedral, by the way, has got it's it's one of the original, um, it's, it's one of the oldest, should I say, uh, institutions. So it would have been a monastic institution to begin with. It was uh, never a, um, never an abbey as as such. It was a teaching. Um, cathedral so there were monks here uh, but anyway that's that's a different story so so you've got the chess team and you've got this incredible chantry with all of the heraldry and uh, badges to show that there is an incredibly important person buried here um, so Shall we have a look at a few of them? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I am gonna use my notes to just to make sure that I, well, try and capture all of them. Now I have got some close-ups, so let's go for that. Oh, first of all, let me just show you this because I love this. These for people listening and not watching, there is this, there's two steps that that go up from the high altar. So you're to the right of the high altar. The chantry is 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 placed and there's two steps and I think the bottom one looks like it may have been replaced at some point but the top step so as you go into the chantry is so dipped with the number of feet that have passed there including Elizabeth I who uh who visited Worcester I want to say in 1575 um and she would have visited the cathedral and she visited the uh, the the chantry of her uncle. So I love that. I just I find that there's such a tangible link to to the past and to everyone who has visited here. Uh, on the rise of the Tudors tour in September, we will be coming here. So any of you who are on that tour, um, you will get to also uh, stick your feet <laughs> in the in the depression marks and add to the erosion. Mm. Okay. So here are some of the close-ups of that incredible um, one side of the chantry. So we're the opposite side to the high altar now. So you can get a really good look um, at the badges that are that are here. And you can see um, 
there's there's the um the the white rose of lancaster the red rose of york um harder to see now that there's no color on them uh edward the sixth reformation got its hands on worcester cathedral of course um and then of course you had well you've had movements uh since which is which have stripped uh, churches and cathedrals of their decoration and unfortunately nowhere was safe some places got away with it but nowhere was actually safe so yes yeah, so you've got white rows of um uh uh, Lancaster, excuse me, York, excuse me, Red Rose of Lancaster. Uh, we will see the Tudor Rose at some point. There's the uh, feathers of the Prince of Wales on the left-hand side. You've got um, the uh, shield with, um, uh, I think that's the, oh, Welsh dragon, I think. Yeah. And, um, the, yes, that's right. There's a dragon and a greyhound. You can't really tell <laughs> from here. You've got the uh, Fetterlock, um, Falcon and Fetterlock, which is York. Um, and let's have a look at the next slide. Of course, the Portcullis, um, the Beaufort Portcullis, again, the, uh, the, with the Tudor Rose above it. Uh, you have the uh, Order of the Garter emblem there and the pomegranate of his wife, Catherine of Aragon, you've got some fleur-de-lis there as well, representing this um, continuing, uh, um, continuing assertion from the English kings that they uh, were rulers of France, <laughs> which was probably pushing it a bit by this point. Um, oh, I forgot the sheath of arrows. So there's a sheath of arrows um, here in between the um, falcon and uh, fetterlock and uh, one of the roses. And that represented um, Isabella of Castile. So this shows this alliance to Spain. Because, of course, with the death of Arthur, this um, uh, alliance with Spain is very much in danger. And of course, that's one of the things that Henry's trying to do when he marries Catherine of Aragon at the in the end, is he's got a bride here who he knows, um, and he's gonna have an instant, instant link and an elevation because he's marrying a princess, but that obviously, like I say, is in the future. So his chantry, if I go back to the picture that shows it um in all its glory, it it is big. Uh it looks like perhaps it was built elsewhere to be fit here because if you um if you're if you're watching this on the the very right and the very left um you can see that the uh it it's sort of been cut off a little bit so that it so that it fits uh Fletcher Spain or Castile well Catherine of Aragon is by her father Aragon and her mother Castile you have no um, they, they were known as the, the Catholic kings. Um, I'm sort of saying it as shorthand, but it's that it's that link to a Spanish royal family, to the Spanish royals. Um, Claudia, what is known about Prince Arthur's personality? Do you know what, Claudia? Hold that thought. I, I will put that to Gareth Streeter when I interview him in a few weeks time if that's okay and we will have that in the that in the interview. That will be quite fun to ask him about. Because he seems like a, um, he seems to get on with everybody. He is athletically, uh, he has athletic prowess. Um, I don't know, um, uh, I can't remember, I think academically he was supposed to be bright, maybe not as bright as his uh, niece would be. But um, of course there's the, you have to think as well, when someone dies young um, and, tra and so tragically and so quickly, um, the accounts, I, I wonder whether someone's personality is sometimes elevated and their flaws, uh, understandably, sort of not talked about, suppressed in terms of talking about their personality and but I don't know. I'll get into that with uh, with Gareth Streeter. That will be really interesting. Um, 
The Rise of the Tudors tour, which I've mentioned, it is fully booked now. So I'm sorry if you were wanting to come on that. Maybe we'll repeat it if there's um, if there's a demand. If people want to do it, we will do it. It's going to visit uh, Henry the Seventh's birthplace at Pembroke um, Castle. We're going to go to Raglan Castle as well. We're going to um, uh, we're going to Ludlow Castle. We're going to Worcester Cathedral. Um, I've forgotten somewhere. We're going to go to Gloucester Cathedral because I can't go past Gloucester Cathedral and not pe not take people there. It's too beautiful. Uh, oh, and Winchester, of course. We have a day in Winchester. We have a day in Winchester with Julian Humphreys, who any of you who have met, uh, yes, Marianne, uh, um, or not speaking ill of the dead. Absolutely, yes, that's that's the point I was trying to make. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we're going to have a day in Winchester, which, of course, is the uh, birthplace of Arthur who we've been talking about today, we're going to be, um, oh, I can take this down now, can't I? So we're going to be going there with, with Julian. We will be having a talk. Well, Gareth Russell is my tour historian on the tour. He will be giving talks. We've also got Nicola Tallis joining us and we've got Nathan Army. Now, if you're a member of my Patreon, uh, I will be recording those talks as I do actually on the other tours as well, on the Anne Boleyn tours that we've got going soon. And those tours will make it into Patreon. So you will be able to watch those. So another great reason to become a Patreon. Uh, it's uh, www.patreon.com forward slash British history. Um, Gina, Gina also already says, yes, please repeat Rise of the Tudors. Um, yeah, maybe I will. Because it's, 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 I'm really, really looking forward to taking people to a different part of the country. So our Anne Boleyn tour is fantastic and I'm about to launch two for next year. Uh, so if you're, again, if you're a member of my Patreon, you get access to book tours seven days in advance from going on general release. And they, uh, I'm going to be releasing the two dates for the Anne Boleyn tour for 2025 uh, on the 9th. Is that Tuesday? Um, and then the following week, they'll go on general release. Um, Melissa's coming in September. I can't. I can't wait. I honestly, I I genuinely get so excited about taking people to places that um that the the they're hard, genuinely harder to get to if you're um you know if you're coming to to Britain and you wanted to go to Pembroke Castle. I didn't make it to Pembroke Castle until a couple of years ago. Despite what I do for a living, despite my love of the Tudors, because it's not the easiest place to get to. And if you're in the country um, and you've got to work out how to get there, anyway, I deal with all of that. That's not a problem. And um, so anyway, so we'll be going to those places. We've got those wonderful speakers. Um, so uh, like I say, if you um, are not coming on the tour, though, you get to see those talks. I'll put them into Patreon at some point during the following uh, year and I say that because we have so we I do have uh, wonderful things in there and I don't like to bombard uh, bombard people. So uh, that said, please do like this video, hit subscribe and hit the bell button. I never remember to say that. Tonight I am back at eight fifteen with the Had Girls. So it's History After Dark uh, on YouTube. Uh, myself, Dr. Kat Marchant for Reading the Past, and Catherine Ibbotson. We are tonight talking about Princess Charlotte. Princess Charlotte, the Han Hope of Hanover. She was the daughter of the Prince Regent, who became George IV. And we're going to be talking about her life and tragic uh, death. Um, Melanie says, agreed about the tours. Um, very solo travel, especially if it's in a country whose drivers drive on the opposite side of the street. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Uh, SJ, I'd be very interested to know how many times a spare had to replace a predeceased sibling on the throne. You have just reminded me. I wrote that down as a topic, like to do a video on. SJ, thank you for that. I will. I will work on that. We'll do that. That'll be a. That would be a cool uh, live, wouldn't it? 
So everyone, hopefully you can meet, uh, meet, you meet me, meet me tonight. I'll come back tonight for History After Dark, 8.15 UK time on the History After Dark YouTube channel. And we'll be speaking about Princess Charlotte, as I say, or you can join me here next week at 3 in the afternoon, same time, same place as this week. I'm going to let you go now. I have got some tour prep to do. We are four weeks away from the first tour of the season. Um, so, and, and like I said, I'm trying to get 2025's tours ready as well. So it's all very busy, very wonderful. So I'll leave you to your day. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll speak to you soon. Bye.